All right, well, I guess I'm gonna kick things off. I'm Larry Watt. I'm the board president at the Living Hand Municipal Water District. Um, we've got a lot of staff and consultants with us here tonight. I've got two of my board colleagues in this, uh, in this Zoom meeting. Uh, we've got Director Christy Bruce Lane is here, as well as Director Bob Topolovac, and the project is actually in Director Topolovac's district. So uh, this is, I believe, our second community meeting on this San Diego Valley groundwater basin project. We thank you all for joining us here tonight. We, uh, we did the first meeting at Solana Santa Fe Elementary School back before anybody had heard of COVID. And we'd certainly prefer to be doing it uh, in person, but uh, this is the way we do things these days. We sit in our, sit in our homes. Um, I have my slippers on, but you'll never see them. Um, and we talk to each other on Zoom. <clears throat> so again, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, what we'd like to do is have the staff and the consultants go through the presentation. <clears throat> There's a lot of technical data in the presentation. Uh, the board has heard the presentation previously at our board meeting. Um, we know that you're all interested in this project, <clears throat> probably as interested as we are. You know, it's an opportunity for us to develop a local source of water rather than having to import water from uh, hundreds of miles away, either from Northern California or from the Colorado River. So um, with that, I think Director Topolovac wanted to say a few words. Is that right, Bob? You can have we to un unmute, Bob. Can, can we unmute, Bob, please? Oh, we gotta try one more time. One more, Bob. Uh, how are we doing now? There you go. You're good now, Bob. Fantastic. All right. Everybody tries to shut me up, and even on Zoom, they try to do the same thing. <laughs> Anyhow, hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is going to be a very, very long presentation, so basically piggybacking on Larry. I'm sorry we have to do it this way, but uh, we really appreciate you being here and uh, looking forward to any questions and uh, your input after the presentation. So thank you. All right, Joey, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you, President Watt. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we'll work through this the best we can, but uh, we sure appreciate it. We have got actually 28 RSVPs and some other folks uh, that could be joining us. So it's a great turnout, a lot of interest in, in the area, lots, lots of partners. And I'd like to start off with that, with our partners, our funding partners, the Department of Water Resources and their generosity in awarding the uh, grant that's funding this project, along with the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and the San Diego County Water Authority through the Future Supply Actions Funding. It's a very popular project. We've been awarded um, quite a bit of grant, grant funding uh, from the beginning, all the way back through the feasibility study. So it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, I'd like to take a minute to introduce the project team um, and also some of the staff that's on the call here as well. Um, you know, obviously, as, as your water district, we're here to serve any, all, any and all of your water related needs. And there's some good key folks on the line here today that not just related to this project, but anything to do with your water bills or anything like that. We, we, we do, our, do our best to provide the, the highest customer service possible. Um, I want to introduce Don McFarlane, our consulting engineer, and he's been our project lead here. We've got uh, Nathan Reynolds. Tim Chen and Brian Villalobos from uh, Geosciences. There are principals in the technical support here. They'll also be presenting tonight. Craig Erickson and, and Rosalind Prickett from Woodard and Kern with our environmental and our engineering support. And also Jenny Wendell and Leslie Spring from our communications and outreach. Thanks for making this happen tonight. Um, we also have some key staff on, on the call today. I wanna to thank Armand Tarzi. He's our analyst and, and outreach specialist that also coordinated this, Joe Jensen. Uh, is on the call and, and coordinating with us. We've got Jeff Falks, our operations manager. I see John Carnegie, our customer services manager. And last but not least, we've got Kimberly Thorner, our general manager, who will also actually be helping us with the presentation here just in a minute. Um, and there may be other folks too, I apologize. We, it's an open invite, so there may be folks, I'm sorry if I missed you, I can only see so many on my screen here. Um, but just a little bit of, um, you know, laying the foundation, the ground rules, we are gonna try to be um, efficient with everyone's time tonight. It is quite a technical and, and it is a little bit of a lengthy presentation. Um, but that being said, I think with those on the call, there's, there's uh, not only, you know, neighbors, but there's also 
uh, pumpers and well owners in the area. So there's there's lots of di uh, divergent and consistent uh, um, interest in the project from from those of you on the call here. Um, so we will try to, there are a couple of natural uh, kind of pauses in the presentation that will be able to unmute the crowd. And if there's any Q&A, I also wanna point out the chat feature. Um, that is a great place to, to go ahead and, and enter in any questions. If you wanna make sure that you're not missed, Joe's gonna help cue those up for me at the end uh, where we can address those adequately. Um, but we will probably try to work through, as best we can work through the presentation as many of those questions might be answered, and then we'll do the Q&A at the end. Uh, but it is a great opportunity. Please bring your questions. We've got these technical experts on the phone. This is kind of a wrap up to this portion of the project. Uh, I should say it's not kind of, it is the wrap up to this, to this portion of the project, this pilot test well um, a piece. And so it's very important uh, what we found, but it's also a great opportunity while we've got these technical experts on the line to, to kind of field questions that you may have. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring up the PowerPoint here and we will, I also um, need to point out that we will actually, we'll actually be recording this or we are recording this and we're going to make it available on the OMWD YouTube channel um, immediately following. So if you, if you missed anything, um, if you, you know, wanted to look at one of the charts a little closer, uh, we'll be able to, you know, provide that to you. Um, we can all there's also a link uh, at alevenhain.com backslash groundwater it's got all of the information here that was also a part of your invite which is probably how you were um you know notified of this event so with time efficiency in mind without further ado the general manager kimberly a thorner uh let's make sure she's unmuted <laughs> so she can uh um get to her get her microphone open she's going to kick it off with kind of a state of the state of water, um, you know, every year it, it changes. And so we do have a few things uh, to update folks on at that point. So it looks like, Joe, it looks like uh, Kim's muted. There we go. Okay, it, it kept telling me the host will not allow me to unmute. <laughs> Apologies, it wasn't me. No. <laughs> okay, thank you, for, thank you for that introduction, Joey. And thank you for everyone for taking time out of your evening to join us. Um, I do recognize a lot of faces um, from the past, from the past community meetings. So thank you for coming back to see the progress that we've made to date. And I, I do see a lot of new faces. And so the next couple of slides um, just are kind of talking about who OMWD is and why we would undertake a project like this in the first place. And then we'll get into the results. But um, for those of you um, that haven't had this presentation before, um, Olivenheim is not just a water agency. We are a um, potable water, uh, wastewater treatment. We operate a um, reclamation, wastewater and reclamation facility out in the forest ranch area. We serve recycled water um, throughout our service area. We're actually very proud um, in the last 10 years to convert about 15% of our potable water supply over to recycled water. Um, a majority of actually all but one of our golf courses are now on recycled water. We do uh, own and operate the Elfin Forest Recreational Reserve out in uh, forest, um, actually Elfin Forest. And then we do also do um, hydroelectricity, not just at our water treatment plant, but throughout our system and offset a significant portion of the electrical demands of our water treatment plant. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, Alevenheim, 48 square miles, 86,000 customers, 90% built out, um, hundreds, 466 miles of potable pipeline. Um, you can read this and, and as you can see, we're a very well-developed, efficient, um, multi-function government agency um, operating in North Ca County, San Diego. So the question is, okay, why would an agency that has all this going on want to look at an additional groundwater supply? And the answer to that is, but for that 15% recycled water that I just spoke to you about, we are 100% reliant on imported supply. And um, not only is it increasingly expensive, um, and the new, the new forms of technology um, are more expensive, but it's getting more expensive to bring water into the county. Um, if you've read the news at all, 
um, imported water is more vulnerable. In fact, um, last week, the, the focus was on the Colorado River and that Lake Mead is about to hit historic lows. And they, they believe they're going to hit those in the, in the next uh, two years. And that's where we get our water. Uh, we get our water from Colorado and Northern California. And so our board directed us a few years ago to look at how can we have local drought resilient, reliable supplies and recycled water at the forefront um, of what we're looking at? That's one component. This groundwater project is another. And then um, probably too long for this presentation today, but soon to come to you is a Levin Heinz Urban Water Management Plan, where we're comprehensively looking at our supplies moving forward. And this project is so shown in our Urban Water Management Plan as a conceptual project. And um, at this point, um, we do have it um, in our future. If the results of um, what we're doing now and over the next few years um, prove positive and cost effective, we will bring it back to our board and, and hope that they can include it as part of our water supply portfolio. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Joey to talk about what we've done today and then we'll get into the results. Thank you, Kim. Okay, so going back a few years, hitting the rewind button back in 2017, uh, we conducted and completed a feasibility study. So it was a, it was a paper study of the feasibility of extracting groundwater in either the, we started in the San Alejo uh, Valley Groundwater Basin. We also looked at the San Diego Valley Groundwater Basin. We kind of honed in in San Diego. Uh, again, in this paper study, we looked at things like groundwater rights, adjudicated, non-adjudicated basins. We looked at um, the potential for what, what increment of water may be available. We looked at historical pumping records. Um, we evaluated water quality. We took samples and, and looked at water quality. We evaluated treatment options, you know, if it was actually feasible to even um, treat this level of uh, contamination in the, in the groundwater supply. Um, we were able to look at the facilities that it would take, you know, the pipelines and a huge component of this project is, is what, would, what we call the brine line or it would be the brine disposal is a byproduct of reverse osmosis treatment, which would be required with the water quality that's existing in this basin. Uh, and where that would have to go, where we would be able to dispose of that uh, brine uh, effectively, which ultimately turned out to be the San Leo Joint Powers Authority up in Cardiff there, so quite a ways. Um, we were able to develop cost estimates and and kind of and kind of look at it as a whole, but again, kind of as a as a as a um, kind of a tabletop or a, an on paper exercise. So what that told us was is that the, the project was feasible um, at, at about one in one million gallons a day. So I, I I apologize in advance for the acronyms. Some of you have suffered through um, this with me, but a million gallons a day is is basically the size of that water treatment plant that would make this project viable. So um, that's kind of a minimum size. Uh, we also looked at the at a cost competitive uh, nature from imported water and specifically looking at the seawater desalination and if this could be a, delivered at a cost competitive uh, price point. Um, we did look at different areas of the of the groundwater basin and the well field. We figured out where we'd like to have a potential test well if that was a, an opportunity. Um, we did verify that we do believe that we could treat to meet federal and state drinking water regulations and standards. Um, and again, I mentioned the, the brine disposal via the ocean outfall uh, was the preference of the regulators. So after we comp completed this, this feasibility study, it kind of it was, a, it was a green light to kind of take the next step. And with the help of the Department of Water Resources at that time, we were able to apply for a, a desalination grant through the state of California. And we were, we were awarded and that, that allowed us to say, okay, well, this is all on paper. What would we wanna to do to actually prove this out? And that first step is, was this, to, was this pilot test well, where we were actually able to, to install a test well, set up the, the proper discharge um, from, for the groundwater, found a local partner um, where we could site that well in a, in, a, in a suitable location. And here to help me kind of fill in the gaps from the last time we spoke of, of talking about installing that test well is our project manager, Don McFarland, our consulting engineer. Don, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? You sound good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Joey. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you know, we constructed a uh, test well. Um, first of all, our team of geologists, some of whom will speak later in this presentation, 
uh, identified a favorable well site and we drilled a small diameter hole to about 150 feet. And doing that, we verified the geology was what we expected. And we found the clay layer, which is known as an aquitard that separates the upper part of the groundwater basin from the lower part. And that's, uh, that's key to what we'll uh, talk about later in the presentation. And there's a number of photos here showing the construction. One of the key uh, aspects of that was the sound wall. And that sound wall was to insulate the noise uh, so that it didn't bother the neighbors in the area. But it also helped us uh, with the biology in the area, the species that live down along the river and uh, not disturbing them during uh, the nesting season. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, many and many of you uh, were out there during construction too. I, I'd uh, mentioned so you've you've seen this before. Uh, next slide, please. And so then, what we did was enlarge that small diameter hole once we knew the geology was what we were looking at, and we installed a um, an 18 inch casing. Uh, you can see on the right side of the slide there, and then packed uh, gravel around it. The screened openings where water can get into the well is from about a hundred, it's from about 60 to 125 feet, and the well was set at a hundred feet. Next slide, please. And so then we developed the well, and this is a process of surging and moving water around like a washing machine, basically, to try and get all the fines and suspended material out of the well. Uh, and after that was done, we ran a series of pump tests and established the discharge of the well at about 200 gallons a minute. As Joey mentioned, uh, we had a state issued permit uh, to, to use the, the water from the well beneficially and to discharge the water uh, during the one year pump test. Next slide, please. And so uh, that completes what I wanted to say about the construction of the well. You can see the finished well here in the picture. And Brian Villalobos will take over to describe the one-year pump test and the results. Thank Great. you, Don. All right, there you are, Brian. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to describe the, uh, the long-term pump test that we did. But just before I do, I just wanted to quickly say the reason why we did a long-term uh, long pump test as, as uh, Joey had said, that the work that we had done was to look at all of the information that was available in the basin and, and construct a groundwater model, knowing, uh, looking at drillers logs and looking at uh, pumping data that we could get a hold of, looking at water use throughout the basin to build a water balance to understand how much water was coming in and going out. But the purpose of the long-term pumping test was to apply a known stress or a known uh, extraction rate for an entire year through wet and dry seasons to be able to confirm how the water levels were acting. And, and that would give us, gives us a more accurate understanding of the actual flows. So let me just move on then. So the next slide, um, you can, whoever, uh, thank you. So this is kind of a busy uh, map, but the center of the map shows the San Diego Basin. Um, the, the blue dots uh, are, are pumping wells that we, we know in the area. The orange dots are monitoring wells that we use during this long-term pumping test. And as uh, Don is, it was explaining, the, the, the San Diego Basin has two, uh, two portions of the aquifer. Uh, the aquifer is the groundwater basin that holds the water. The upper part is a shallow zone that's about, you know, averages about 60 feet thick you know, from ground surface to about 60 feet. Beneath that is an aquitard, which means it, it's a, a, that's a clay or a, a, a continuous silt clay layer that doesn't let water go down through it very readily. It's very, very impermeable. Those clays were developed back in geologic time when the, the, the sea levels were higher and the, the ocean moved back up into this basin. Below that is a, is a thicker coarse grain, uh, which we're called the lower aquifer, that extends to the bottom of the basin or the bedrock. And the base of the, uh, of the basin is tied to ancient sea levels. So basically we have two aquifers and most of the wells in the area are pumping out of the lower. But we wanted to monitor both the upper and the lower because the upper aquifer is fed by the stream 
is fed, uh, fed by uh, reach uh, surface water further up the basin as it comes out of Hodges and down into the main basin. We wanted to make sure too that if you're pumping out of the lower, as many wells are, you're not taking anything from the stream. That's, that was an important. So we were monitoring wells in the upper and monitoring wells in the lower. Now these charts that are on here are actually a plots of water level. In all of these monitoring wells, we installed what you call electronic transducers that record water levels literally every 15 minutes. So throughout the, throughout the year, we had a continuous recording of water levels uh, while we were pumping the test well, as well as other people are pumping in the basin, just doing what they've been doing you know, for the last so many years. So the, uh, the chart uh, here on the left-hand side, right in the middle says OMWD desalter test well, that's the water levels in the desalter. So as we were pumping the desalter, uh, the, the new test well, we call it desalter because it's, it's a brackish, brackish water is coming out of it. We were tracking the depth of the that the water was being lowered. Right below uh, that is, is, is a plot of, of about five different uh, wells, surf cup number two, surf cup wells are right near the test well, and other wells further afield. This valley seven is down across the, the basin. We wanted to track when we're pumping the test well, what's going on with these other wells. And then over across the chart here, you have uh, uh, Morgan Run, which is the which is the golf course, as you all know. And the water levels in their wells. So we wanted to see what was happening, and they're also pumping their wells. So how is our well, the the test well, doing the, those wells? And now and then below that is Morgan Run shallow pisometers. These were put in a number of years ago. And, you, and these are monitoring water levels that are in the upper part of the area. So let's go to the next slide. Hey, Brian, real quick, try, um, you're, you're kind of choppy on your audio. Maybe try to uh, turn off your video. Might help with your bandwidth on, on your audio. Anybody there? Not sure who's relied on that show. Do what again? I'm sorry, Joey. Hey, Brian, do you try to, um, you're froze up on your video. So maybe if you, if you pause your video or turn your video off, it might help your bandwidth with the audio. Okay. There you go. Give that a try. Okay. So you want to do it that way? Yeah, I okay, could, I could hear you fine. It was just getting oh, a little Okay. Choppy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Right. Thank you. So this next slide shows the, okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, we hear you. Okay, I'll I'll continue until somebody says not to. <laughs> okay. So the next slide uh, shows the wells that actually were influenced by the test well. So in other words, when we were pumping the test well and and taking water at that location, the wells that were showing that they were also being drawn down uh, by the test well drawdown to these green wells that. That are right in this area, so it really was a, uh, didn't extend the impact didn't extend that far out. Let's go to the next slide. Can we get the next slide? I think I think we're having a tough uh, tough connection, Brian. Did I share my screen, Joe? Uh, actually, I think you're, it's just your bandwidth. Okay, I mean, but I'm, okay, so we got that connection then. I mean, we've got yeah, the new slide. This is the next slide, yep. Okay, okay, great. All right, so let me go through this slide. So uh, you can see that we started putting, uh, started taking water levels in, in some of the monitorings way back in September of 2019. So we'd have a baseline, in other words, we'd have, water levels well before any pumping was taken, and that's called a baseline. So we know what was happening before. The green line, the green thick line here on the left side of the chart is the beginning of the, is the, beginning of the, of the, of the test. Uh, let me get that right. No, I'm wrong, I'm sorry. The beginning of the test is right around, uh, yeah, December of 2020. So what we were, what we were, what these are showing us is that we started the pumping of the wells of the test well, 
and water levels in the areas surrounding the test well begin to draw down. So right about the green, the green line, you can see where there is a, a little bit of a drop right there, a little in all three of these that are plotting, a little bit of drop. That's the effect of the test well. So as the test well is pumping, it reaches an equilibrium. It was about 215 gallons a minute uh, on average. These water levels will stabilize. So you can see essentially they're stabilizing where now we're getting through spring and then into summer. And then, uh, and then as we move on in the driest parts of the year in August, uh, about two th uh, three quarters of the way over on the chart, they're at their lowest. But then when we turn the test, uh, the test well off, you can see the water levels recover. You can see that little break around the red line where the water levels then go back up. So that's, you can, so we were able to track these water levels clearly and exactly what was, how they were being influenced by the test well. Let's go to the next slide, please. Great. So now this chart is water levels, again, in the shallow, the shallow part of the aquifer above the aquitard. And what we see in this chart, again, uh, starting way back in September, 2019, then through the test well pumping period around the green line, then extending all the way through to the end of this last year, what, what we're seeing is that there, there was no impact at all by the test well. The test well does not influence any of the water levels in that upper aquifer. What does influence the upper aquifer is rainfall, so you can see where these little blips go up, say around the green line. You can see down at the bottom, there are these blue bars, thin blue bars, that's rainfall. So you can see when rainfall occurs, uh, uh, if someone's uh, circling it, you can see right next to the green line to your right is rainfall here. Okay, you can tr uh, take your cursor and go all the way down to the bottom of the page. You can see those blue bars. So wherever rainfall occurs, you can see the water levels go up. And what's amazing, and this is typical for coastal basins in, in along Southern California, is that rainfall recharges the aquifer very quickly in the upper parts. So we, we saw that then also this last year, they let uh, releases from Lake Hodges. So the they let water out of the dam, the water came down the canyon, down the creek, and then down into the basin. And that's this gray area. So the highest peak or the highest water level rise in the shallow aquifer was actually from the rainfall plus Lake Hodges releases. So we know the shallow aquifer responds to surface water, rainfall and surface water releases, but it's not being affected by pumping that's taking place below that aquitard. So that says that that aquitard is a pretty tight seal between what's happening in the stream bed and in the upper aquifer and the lower aquifer. Okay, let's go to the next one. Probably need to move a little faster, sorry guys. So here we here then are the Morgan Run uh, our, our deep piezometers. In other words, monitor the dedicated monitoring wells that are screened have uh, areas for the water to get in, but only in the deep. And these uh, were responding exactly to the pumping, right? And also we see it uh, based on the seasons. So as during the dry seasons, you get the the lowest levels, which is typical in in in, in every groundwater basin. Uh, and more typical in shallow groundwater basins like San Dieguito or San Luis Rey or the Mission Basin, you, you, they follow the seasons really well. So we were able to track uh, very clearly what was taking place in the, in the basin. Let's go to the next one then. Now I wanted to also show you this, another busy slide, but it's, it's, uh, it's a combination of, of our current data, which is the big boxes in there over what we showed in the feasibility study when we were doing the research and looking at water quality. What we know about the San Diego Basin is it's, a, it's very brackish. It ranges anywhere from 1800 TDS to upwards of 5000 TDS. The TDS of the desalter well was around 3500. So when we were pumping the desalter well, we were pu pumping water that was at 3500. To give you a comparison, uh, the secondary drinking water standard for TDS is 1,000. The primary standard is about 500. So you can see that 3,500 is, is multiple times above what drinking water is. So this is brackish water. It cannot be used without treatment. I mean, some agriculture can use some of it, but it can't be, none of this could be used to add to a potable supply without treatment. Let's go to the next slide. 
And I will, I guess I'll turn this back to Joey and or Craig. Okay. okay, great. As part of speaking of water quality, um, two of the major constituents that are, are found in the groundwater basin as far as uh, treatment water standards is iron and manganese. And so this was a big part of our, of our efforts was to figure out how we might go about treating for that iron and manganese. And there's a few different methods in order to do that. Um, this is one of the things that our, that our grant funding agencies were very interested in because it is a common problem um, that many um, you know, treatment plants deal with. So iron and manganese were present. Uh, again, arsenic is a, national, a naturally, occurring, um, naturally occurring mineral in the, in the region's groundwater specifically. It is a, it is a health concern. Um, it also is a treatment concern because it can actually damage our reverse osmosis membranes. And so it's a very, um, someone like Kim can tell you and some water quality experts, we, we operate a, a giant um, membrane water treatment plant in the David C. McCollum uh, filtration plant, which provides uh, most of your water supply there. And we've got to protect those membranes. So we tested uh, different types of filtration media, the green sand plus the manganese oxide. Um, and we were able to do that right on site. So we we're actually able to bring a little skid, a little trailer uh, right out on site, go through that process. Uh, we were able to collect some, some very valuable data and um, we feel comfortable with our, with our approved or you know, the process that we were um, initially you know, kind of committed to, which was you know, iron and manganese pre-treatment, have to do some additional, that's a little bit different cost, a little bit higher cost, a little bit higher energy intensity, but it also is worth it in order to protect our membranes. And we'll get in a little bit more into this as well if, if we have some, some time in the Q&A. So getting back to the groundwater model update, Brian will jump back in there. Great, so let's go, into the, go to the next slide. So again, this, is a, this picture is the 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 San Dieguito groundwater basin, the yellow area right in the middle, is the 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 edges of the actual ground. And the the green area is all the way to the black edges are the watershed. In other words, the water that precipitation falls into the bay. Sorry, hold on a second, Brian. I just was gonna check in is I'm, I'm having a I'm having a hard time um, picking Brian up is just by not a heads is am I the only one or is everybody having a hard time there? It's okay. Um, Brian, your uh, your bandwidth is cutting out. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna jump in here and, and kind of go through this groundwater model. If you can improve your uh, connection, please do so and, and jump in there and let us know, okay? Okay. Thank you. And, and Mr. McFarland, feel free to jump in there and, and help me out here. So this was a key piece of the project and, and hopefully we can get Brian, um, like I say, our, our, our technical expert back, back in line here. Um, but just for, for folks on the call, the, the groundwater model update was, was, is kind of the key piece as a planning tool from a water, from a water supply planning perspective. Um, it allows us to run scenarios such as multi, multiple, dry, uh, multiple dry years consecutively, multiple wet years. Um, you saw the, the, the technical specificity that our, our tools are able to pick up where you know, Lake Hodge is spilled. Um, we're able to see that come down. We're able to see that infiltrate into the groundwater basin, and we see the correlating the, the correlating um, data in our transducers that are that are present in those wells. So this groundwater model is is, is basically how we go about that planning. Because what the the biggest thing we don't want to do is just come in here and, and harm an aquifer, right? And that's what um, you, you know that's what uh, the the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act is is uh, you know put in place in order to to govern. And to oversee and to protect the groundwater basin. So this model allows us to look at how different conditions uh, affect that. Um, so this is the this is the the San Diego basin, the lower basin, I should say. Um, you can kind of, as far as orienting yourself, you can see it touches the beach here in Del Mar. 
um, all the way up to pretty much the dam at Lake Hodges is where that begins on, on, on the right hand side and, and the surrounding green area is kind of what we consider the, the inundation area. It's what's, it's what's moving in and moving out of the groundwater basin. Um, we, they do this by 50, 50 foot by 50 foot grids. So they're able to actually plot this out. It's very technical, um, it's very detailed, and, but they're able to build this model uh, 50 foot by 50 foot increment throughout the entire um, watershed. So there are different layers present and we were able to figure that out through, our, through the different groundwater, um, the different uh, geophysical traits that we were able to pull up through the, not only the test well, but, but some of the other um, wells in the area that we had the well logs. So we were able to see the permeability and the types of the layers that we're dealing with. And again, that kind of points out through this color-coded um, this color-coded model where that aquitard exists. Um, we were able to refine the layer thickness of each of those aquitards because we actually had the drill cuttings um, um, from that well. So we had the geologists actually study that and, and were able to refine that so we know exactly how far the different permeable layers are. Uh, it actually informed us on where, where to place our screened intervals for the well. Um, this is, the, this is the target wells that we knew we were within uh, a, a um, certain distance away from that we may have an impact on, um, as Brian uh, you know, kind of previously alluded to. So these were the, these were the wells that we were really key, cued in on uh, in monitoring. There's about 16 of them and they had our, our high-tech uh, equipment within there. Um, these are just the different model layers and how they and how we go about corresponding that model or how, how, how we make that data match. And so you can see the blips. Um, actually, you probably can't see, it's probably too small, but um, we're able to look at historical data uh, alongside our uh, data that we were able to collect throughout the one-year pump test in order to calibrate that model to make sure that we were in a, 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 an adequate plus or minus. Uh, so okay. this... Joey, can you hear me now? Oh, there you go, Brian. Yep, I do hear you. <laughs> Brian. Okay, thank you. That last slide Whew. was that last slide was key because it it represents the model's ability to capture the actual data. So you have a good model if when you simulate something, it actually predicts what has already happened. So that's called model calibration. So that next slide is what we call uh, go ahead and change it the calibration statistics. So at uh, the bottom, it says relative error less than 10% is considered a good fit. And our relative error was 6.8 feet or 6.8. So it, it falls well within the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the modeling standards and it's actually better. It's, 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 it's definitely a good, good fit. Let's go to the next one. So, so the, the idea of the model using all of the data, can you guys still hear me? I hope. Yeah, you're doing good, okay. Brian. Great. Well, clear. So the idea of the of the of all of the data that we collected, you know, 16 different piezometers that were used, the pumping, a year-long data, we took all of that information to revise the model to be able to uh, to recalibrate it to make sure that it was matching everything that we collected. So, and all of that, the purpose of all of that was then to update the water balance. In other words, how much water is coming in and how much water is going out. So let's go to that next slide then. So this is uh, what we call a water, the water balance component. So uh, think of a water balance like a bank account. You've got things that are going in, you've got things that are going out. What's going in in this case is what we call mountain front recharge. That's water that's coming from the edges of the basin into the in interior of the basin. You've got uh, rainfall, you've got uh, recharge in ponds like the, the, uh, the ponds that are in the basin provide water stream leakage that's going into that upper part of the aquifer, and then what we call return flow, wherever there's landscape, like on the golf courses or in somebody's yard or, or where there's ag fields, part of that water makes it back down to the basin. And then also we have subsurface flow coming from upstream and we also uh, have ocean water that moves in and out of the basin near the coast. Way back in the day, the, US, the United States Geological Survey had definitely shown that a lot of historic pumping had brought seawater in, and that's part of the problem with the high salts in the basin, part of it, not all of it. So in the outflows are basically the pumping. That's the largest amount that's going out. You have uh, evaporation or evapotranspiration, uh, water that's being released through the plants and the golf courses and everything going back to the atmosphere, atmos uh, back to the atmosphere. Then you've got some water going to the stream in the upper part, 
And then you got outflow to the ocean. So water in the basins actually flowing out to the ocean. And then the, the arrow, blue arrow going up and the blue arrow going down is water level that changes the storage in the basin. So again, like the bank account, if you pull too much water out, then you're losing storage. But sometimes you get more water in and you're push, pushing it out the other side. So that water you want to capture because then you're actually managing the basin. Let's go to the next one. So this, in 2017, in the feasibility study, we, did, we ran uh, scenarios using the model. And one of the things we wanted to see is that if we pumped a thousand GPM out of the basin, what would that do to the overall basin? What would be, uh, could, could you manage taking that water out without causing all kinds, you know, excessive drawdowns and losses in the basin? So at that time, we, looked, we selected two sites to pump 500 GPM each out of those sites, and that amounts to about 1,600 acre feet a year. So for the 2021 modeling, just what, the, what we fit recently committed, we did again, we did two well sites, but what we did this time was, uh, because the test well was around 215, but we modeled it at say 200 GPM. Then we, the second site, we, we looked at, uh, uh, two other sites we looked at at 400 each, 400 gallons a minute each, to again, so we're comparing apples with apples. 1,000 GPM, 1,000 GPM, but then using those, those particular wells. Let's go to the next one. And just wanted to, this slide is basically showing that you actually can pump, you actually can pump that amount of water, even though the test well, which was located uh, in an area near the surf cup was doing about 200 GPM. It, other areas in the basin, as you can see, on the slide, there's 600 GPM. Morgan Run Gunnar uh, well can do 1,000 GPM. Up here, uh, where the some of the ag is, 800. So the upper these basins, part, part of the basin, can produce you know higher amounts. And again, as I said earlier, these wa this water is brackish. So let's go to the next slide, and I think this is getting pretty close to the end. So so this all these numbers are the water balance that we that we looked at. So we were looking at what's the underflow. Uh, what are the different inflows and what are the different outflows? So what we saw in the 2017 uh, model run before we collected uh, this data, the baseline run without any pumping, the thousand gallons a minute or 1600 acre feet, you had a surplus storage in the basin of about 130 acre feet. Okay, so that means that uh, that water absolutely is, is going out of the basin and it's not being used. What you had when we pumped a thousand GPM, uh, uh, or 1,600 acre feet a year in that scenario. Uh, at the end of the at the end of the model run, there was a negative 260 acre feet uh, uh, of storage. So the storage went down minus 260 acre feet over that uh, over that 20 year period. Okay, so I mean per year. So what we looked at then now in 2021 with the new calibration and with all of the work that we've done. The baseline was 110 acre feet a year without any additional pumping and pumping the additional uh, 1600 acre feet or 1000 GPM uh, resulted in a minus 150 acre feet per year storage. So what's that saying? That's saying that in, in pumping 1000 GPM or 1600 acre feet a year out of the basin, what, uh, you're, you're producing water for beneficial use of, of 1,600 acre feet, but the basin storage is declining by about 150 acre feet per year. How much is that relatively? That's about 0.6% of the groundwater in storage. Now that means that uh, if you, the basin stores 25,000 acre feet, that you're taking 0.6% of that on an annual basis. But what we, but what you also have to understand with that is the. The period that we've looked at for this modeling period, uh, the, the 20 years that we've looked at, has been, in a sense, if you look at a, a, a rainfall curve, essentially it's been a downward, rain, uh, downward rainfall curve from the, from the beginning of the model period. So what does that mean? It means that throughout this modeling period, we've been dealing with a lot less rainfall. So then someone would ask, well, what about climate change, right? There's going to be climate change and, and everybody's, uh, and, and, and I agree, there is going, we're, you know, we're seeing that there's going to be climate change. But what we're seeing with that is that of the, of the many, many models that are being used, 
uh, the models that we're using for Sigma, and we're working on Sigma projects or groundwater sustainability plans, you know, we're looking at the future will be flashy, flashy heavy rains with low uh, snowpack in the Sierra. So what does that mean? That means we'll have long dry periods, but when we have the rain, it's gonna come heavy and fast. So what's the best way to deal with that is to create storage in the groundwater basin so you can capture that so it's not just flowing out to the ocean. So I'm gonna end it with this, I believe, is that uh, what the test is showing is that we can pump this amount of uh, uh, you know, 1000 GPM additional out of the basin and manage the basin so that it's going to actually be, uh, uh, you know, you're, we're able to collect water when the water is available from recharge as well as keeping water from being wasted going out to sea, both surface and also groundwater. I think that's my last slide, is it? You'll have to let me know. Oh, this is just a, 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 the, the detail water balance uh, for the calibration runs 2017 and 2021 for each one of these areas. And as Joey said, if you want these slides, uh, I think they'll be available and you can look at these actual things in detail. And I think I'm done, guys, thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hang on. You're, you're, we definitely could hear you a lot better that second time. So please hang on for the Q&A if we had any um, if we have any technical questions. Um, so as far as next steps and, and, and again, feel free to utilize the chat if you want to type in a question or again, we're going to open up this, this up to Q&A here, um, but I'm wrapping it up. Um, so our plan moving forward. So of, of all of this data, that we've collected, you, you know, where does that leave OMWD and its decision makers, its five member board of directors that are ultimately, um, you, you know, tasked and elected in order to make these difficult decisions. So what this does is, is helps us wrap up this pilot test well project. It kind of puts that a good stamp of approval on the groundwater model um, it, as far as being well calibrated. Um, there is a little bit of work that, that we need to complete. We've got some maintenance of the, of the well and of the pipeline connecting uh, the well to the, to the temporary discharge um, and the surf, pub, surf cup uh, pond, irrigation pond there. So we have a little bit of work that we need to take care of um, throughout the, this calendar year. We're going to avoid the bird nesting season in, in order to make that a, a little more smooth. Um, and then over the next two years, we're going to continue this kind of feasibility study uh, level assessment. And what that really um, comes down to is, is, a, is a, a series of studies. And, and this is where the rubber is going to kind of meet the road. So we know technically we can do this. We know, we know um, technically there's water available in this basin. We know that it'll conform with the standards set by SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. But what we need to do is a really intense economic analysis. You know, not, it, this isn't a question of, of can we do this anymore? It's necessarily, it's a question of should we do this anymore? Uh, or should, sorry, should we do this? Um, and that is going to have a, a fine-tuned economic analysis where we update the cost estimates of what we think this will build, uh, what it will cost to build this, these facilities necessary to, to implement this stuff. We need to look at uh, siting alternatives. You know, where, where would this be located? You know, I know that that's a question that's on a lot of folks' mind is, is where would the wells be? Where would the potential treatment plant be? Where, how would that locate with traffic and that sort of thing? So, those are the things, that's uh, uh, that alternative review we need to look at over the next two years. Uh, and then we also really need to dig into a peer review and a sustainability review where we're gonna, you know, we have uh, lots of smart folks working on this, but we'd like to do some, some, uh, some kind of some third party taking a look at this project and making sure that we're dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's from not just a water rights perspective, uh, but also from a best practices perspective, you know, in other parts of the state and the country, groundwater is a, is the number one, uh, water supply available to those to those areas. So there's a lot of uh, information that we can glean from from others. Um, so what this next two years is going to be is this kind of baby steps towards an ultimate decision, uh, and it's all about decision support for our board of directors. I mean, this, these are these are the tough calls, um, you, you know, that that board that uh, water agency directors have to make. And I I, I think back to when recycled water was kind of a new thing. And, and I think Director Topolovac could tell you, you know, 25 years ago, it was a tough decision for that board to get into the recycled water business because it was expensive and are people going to want to use it? Are they going to want to buy it? And I'll tell you what, looking back on that now, speaking, um, you know, taking off my own WD hat, they, they sure look smart now making that investment, you know, 20, 20 25 years ago um, into something that's our, our really our, our biggest piece of our supply portfolio outside of imported water. 
So that board, that decision support for our board, we need to be able to answer all the questions as staff um, and to the public. Um, and so that will include at least a couple of workshops um, that we'll you know, distribute and, and there'll be public meetings uh, available for, for anybody that's interested in attending. And what those two workshops will also entail is not only um, any good news, bad news, you, you know, what the, the data that we find, the specifics, but it'll also be an, uh, provide for an off ramp for our board of directors. If, if something is, uh, if something is amiss, if, if something's not matching up or, or things are just getting too expensive or the water supply um, world changes, you know, dramatically over the next couple of years, it will provide that off ramp opportunity for the board. It's not just, it's not just full steam ahead. It's a, it's a cautiously optimistic approach that we want to really dot our I's and cross our T's as we're moving through there. So that, wraps up the presentation. I know that that was quite a bit on what I do want to um, get into the, oh, I'm sorry. I, this is our timeline. I, I apologize. I stepped all over myself there. Um, this is kind of the timeline you can see going back through the feasibility. Uh, we did our analysis, our pilot test well, and then this is kind of the timeline that we're looking at. If, if this end up, ends up being, um, you know, a viable supply, we'll, we'll be going through a full blown environmental impact report. Uh, we'll be undertaking SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And then we've got to go through all the steps through public procurement, which are which are many. So that would be the that's the kind of the tentative timeline, you know, working through this for folks. With that, this is our opportunity to, to open up to questions to remind folks that we will have this available. Um, uh, this whole recording will be available on the uh, OMWD YouTube channel. Uh, and then we're always available to, if you have questions offline, again, there's, there's my email, phone number. Um, you're always, uh, I know many of you do reach out and we've had plenty of, of conversations um, over the years, but I do see two questions in the chat uh, that we'll get started with. And then um, I think what we'll do is just try to, you know, if you can raise your hand or, or somehow uh, flag us down, Joe's going to help me out, try to find, find these questions. But um, Mark Saxon has a question is, is there anything further that will be built or worked on on the Surf Cup property adjacent to Morgan Run? Thank you, Mark. Good question. So I mentioned that we'd be doing maintenance. Uh, we do have some maintenance on the pump wellhead and on the connecting pipeline. It's the short run of pipeline from the wellhead to the ir to the irrigation pond. Um, that's how we're going to be able to exercise the well in good order. Such time that an ultimate decision is made on this project. So there'll be a little bit of work and we're planning it for after September 15th. That's the end of the bird nesting season. It'll be minimal impact, but basically there'll be, there's some above ground, ground piping that's currently, it's kind of a black pipe if you're, if you're a neighbor there, um, that will be, you know, put underground and, and kind of protected and put out of the way. Um, so that's the first question. The, se the second question from Donald Muse, from Donald M, how does rising sea level with higher salinity of aquifer influence this project? Great question. Um, and Brian hit on that a little bit. As a matter of fact, this project was featured in the San Diego Basin Plan. It was a, it was a, it's a, it's actually a federal funded plan that looked at specifically the adaptability to climate change. And this project was highlighted as, as a preferred project because of its ability to desalt. Um, so in looking at um, the saltwater wedge or, or what, what basically the, the, what, what protects the inland, uh, the inland water bodies, uh, underground aquifers from saltwater intrusion, which did take place in this basin. Back in the 70s, this, this basin was actually heavily used by agriculture. It was actually overdrafted, which allowed saltwater intrusion into the groundwater basin, which is why it's so salty um, nowadays. We, we believe that proper management of that basin will actually improve the water quality and lower the TDS levels, the salt levels within the basin and can, and, and can improve um, habitat as well, potentially. Um, but that being said, this is actually a preferred uh, type of project as, as far as uh, climate change adaptability. Um, we have to construct the, the um, forthcoming facilities in a proper fashion um, that takes into consideration floodplains, um, you, you, you know, um, low Mars, clo Mars for anybody, any of the water geeks or folks on the, on the line. Those are, those are federally required um, um, flood uh, area where, you know, restrictions as far as building. Um, but we think that we can, uh, we can mitigate that. We're a little, we're a little far away from the actual decision of, of any kind of uh, additional buildings. Um, but if, as far as a well being um, impacted, we don't expect that. Really? 
Sir. Yeah, j just real quickly on that, we did model, when we did model the 1,000 GPM, 1,600 acre feet per year, we did not uh, induce seawater intrusion. And even if you raised water levels another three or four feet on the ocean, we're far enough away with current practices that we would not induce seawater intrusion. And if we did, we got the desalter. Okay. Okay, so I see, I see another um, question. Thank you, Brian, for jumping in there. Don, feel free to do so as well. Um, it's a, the chat question is, is, how would this affect the flow of the San Diego River and wildlife that are dependent on the river? Um, and I, I'm gonna let Brian um, maybe get into some of the details, but what I'm gonna tell you is it's not gonna impact the San Diego River um, or the wildlife because we, we actually, that, that's basically what we did with this, with this one year pump test was, was prove that. Um, there's a confining layer with that aquitard, and that's the good news. So we'd like to create some space into that basin where some more of that San Diego River can, that freshwater can flow into the groundwater basin, which will actually, as I mentioned, you know, potentially improve water quality in that area. Brian, you, would you like to chime in on that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, I would. Uh, the, the monitoring wells that we were, and I think I was trying to point that out very clearly, that, that are all along that upper aquifer where the surface water goes, showed no, no effect from all of the pumping in the basin, including the additional pumping that we added. And what I didn't say is Morgan Run brought another well online while we were doing this. I, 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 that was when I was off trying to get further bandwidth. And uh, which was important because then we had another uh, another control point for extractions in the basin. And again, there was no influence on the upper aquifer. Thanks, Brian. I see, an, I, I see an another coming. Oh, hi, Julia. There's a question uh, from Julia Chun here. If fully constructed, this project would contribute about 5% of water supply for the district. Is that about right? And correct, at one MGD, so this is a minimum of one MGD, one million gallons a day, it's about 1600 acre feet. Um, again, we're actually, uh, we're in the process, as Kim mentioned, updating our uh, urban water management plan, our demand forecasts um, as we speak. Um, and so it's between five and 10% of our potable side. Uh, it's a little, little bit above five. Um, and right now it's actually our only alternative potable water supply that we've identified. So we, we do utilize recycled water, obviously to offset, um, to offset potable use for irrigation. But as far as enhancing our potable water supply from that of 100% imported water, this is the only project that we have online outside of the uh, Carlsbad desalination facility, which is a part of the regional supply. And then I have, a, I have another one here. It says, if, if all part of the, uh, from Greg, Greg Tizanovich, hi Greg. Um, if all parts of the project gets green lights, what is the likely date this project could actually produce usable water? Great, great question. I think the next two years, um, I'll, I'll do my best to look into the crystal ball. I think the next two years would, um, you know, will will really define the alternatives there. I think Kim might have a have a to have an opportunity to chime in there too, but. Um, I think that going basically back off of our timeline, we, we have budgeted for this. Uh, we have prepared for this fiscally. Um, we have uh, contemplated its inclusion into our water supply mix uh, through our urban water, through our you know, advanced and future planning efforts. Um, but it would at least be two more years of planning, a year of CEQA, at least, uh, probably a year and a half of construction. Yeah, 2025-ish. Best case scenario. Hope that hope that's close enough. <laughs> I'm waving my hands. Um, that's all of the questions I have on the chat. Did Christine Oyster? Did you have a question there? I saw you. Oh no. Okay, sorry. Any other qu any questions from uh, the audience general or or hopefully our folks unmuted, uh, Leslie? They can. Okay. Can they, I guess why don't we unmute folks so they can. Uh, Sure. Get their mic going if we, um, thank you. Okay, I'm not, I'm not seeing any hands. Yeah, folks who want to speak, want to raise their, I can either unmute everybody or if somebody has a question, I can go ahead and unmute them.
And I don't see any chats coming through. Joey, can you, if someone does have a question after this, how can they submit the question to get it answered? Can you, can you tell them that? Yes, great. Oops. Yes, Kim, thank you. I'm just going to bring my email back up here. Sorry, that was a little clunky. Um, I, uh, yeah, please feel free to either give me a call. Uh, my email is here. Um, it was here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, Jay Randall at alevenhain.com. I, I always appreciate the feedback, you know, catching up with people. Uh, again, many of the pe folks on this call have have had a, a few personal uh, conversations. I see the Carters there. Um, good to see you guys. Um, thanks for your patience. Um, best way is probably to contact me. Thanks, Kim, for the reminder. You know, contact me via email. We do have quite a bit of information on our website, um, including uh, that's alevenhain.com slash groundwater. That includes our feasibility study back from 2017. All of our environmental documentation, we actually did a, an extensive environmental uh, presentation as Maggie, Maggie Brown and some of the folks from the, from the Valley Conservancy there, Friends of the Valley, uh, will know they, they uh, provided some comments for us and Bill Farrell out there, um, uh, an extensive environmental process to make sure we were um, you know, checking all the boxes here. So quite a bit of information on, on the website. It'll definitely put you to sleep at night if, if you're having trouble um, sleeping. Um, but if you want, if you're looking for a synopsis, feel free to reach out to me by phone or or uh, emails is always best, and and I can give you a thoughtful answer. If I don't know the answer, um, I track it down for you. Any other any other questions that we can help folks out with? Well, let me check the chat here. Anything on the chat, Joe? Okay, nothing on the chat. Any other questions? Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, uh, we appreciate your patience. We told you we were going to be come back a year later with some information. It was a, about a year and a half. Um, it was a little longer than than we anticipated, but um, uh, it was it was worth the wait as far as the district concern. A lot of lot of good data, a lot of uh, you know great collaboration with our partners. We we definitely appreciate all the stakeholders and the well owners uh, that allowed us access to their wells for monitoring. Uh, from Morgan Run all the way to Chino Farm and Fairbanks HOA, we very much appreciate all of the collaboration and help. And with that, uh, President Watt and General Manager Thorner, I think we're going to close the um, close the community meeting. Feel free to reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you.